Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's Napa Valley session in celebration of Women's History Month. Today, we hope to share some inspiring stories to salute the many women that make an impact in Napa Valley's wine industry. We have a great lineup today of next generation women winemakers sharing their perspective on leading women winemakers who paved the way for the, this generation. My name is Stacey Emerson. I am the trade marketing manager for Napa Valley Vintners. Napa Valley Vintners is a member organization of nearly 550 member wineries to enhance, promote, and protect the Napa Valley region along with the wonderful wines produced here. When you get a moment, I invite you to visit our new consumer website, napavalley.wine, where you can learn more about our vintners and the valley as a whole wine growing region. If you like today's session, I'd also like to invite you to visit napavalleysessions.com. There you will find a library of previous sessions as well as a calendar of our upcoming sessions as well. Just a little housekeeping, if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A section today. And we will do our best to get your questions answered. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Tanya Pitts. Tanya is a wine and food consultant, speaker, writer, wine judge, and certified sommelier through the Court of Master Sommeliers. Her career has been shaped by a rich ar array of women chefs, as well as restaurant owners. As sommelier and wine director for One Market Restaurant in San Francisco, her curated wine lists include offerings by women, Black and Latino winemakers. And of special note, <clears throat> Tanya's lists have received Wine Spectators Award of Awards for her expansive and inclusive wine program. A true change maker, Tanya is an active philanthropist and mentor whose passion is to improve representation within the wine industry. She is a board member of Wine Unify, the United Sommelier Foundation, and also a committee member of Batonage Mentorship Program. Not which of least, Tanya also holds a professorship at the University of San Francisco working with students. Welcome Tanya and thank you for leading us in today's discussion. Hi Stacey, thank you so much for that warm and uh, generous welcome. Thank My you. name is uh, Tonya Pitts and I'm a longtime sommelier and wine professional here in San Francisco. Um, as of late, I've been at the helm of the wine program at One Market Restaurant for many, many years. And mentorship has been something that's really important to me. It's something that um, I really don't think I'd be where I am today if I had not had mentors as well. What's really fantastic about tonight is that we will be having a conversation with other women in the industry, vintners, um, if you would, from Napa Valley that have had numerous mentors that have helped them along the way, and they are going to share their stories with us tonight. And these are some of the change makers and the next generation of winemakers, vintners, and wine professionals. So I'd like to introduce, firstly, Chelsea Barrett from Matera um, and uh, Junot Family uh, Vineyards this evening. Hi, Chelsea. Thank you for Hi, joining Tonya. us tonight. Thank you so much. And also Evan Cameron, who is the winemaker for Crocker and Star here in Napa Valley as well with us. Evan? Hey, everyone. Hey. And last but not least, Dahlia Seha from Seha Vineyards as well. Hola. Hey, Hola. Thanks, hey, thanks for joining us tonight. Absolutely. So, I just want to dive right in um, to things. And as everyone talks this evening, I'll talk a little bit about myself and my uh, experience with mentorship as well. And this is a roundtable discussion. So this is us kicking back on a what's today thursday <laughs> on a thursday and uh having a conversation and trying some delicious wine that uh everyone uh has tonight as well 
from uh, the, your, your vineyards and your family's uh, portfolios. So Chelsea, how did you get started in wine? I mean, and how, and what kind of mentors did you have as well? What was your wine life like? And did you know this is something that you were going to do? Um, yeah, I guess some of it is fairly obvious, given that my parents are fairly prominent figures in the wine industry. So um, it was my whole life growing up. Both my parents were, you know, always, always working on wine. They were always talking about it at home. We always had wine on the table um, after school and my part time jobs. I was always hanging around wineries and um, so, yeah, it always, it never really struck me, you know, until I was older that like, oh, everybody's family doesn't do this. It was just so normal and ingrained. Um, but we were always very um, crafty and outdoorsy and in, in general. And so I always loved to make things. And so wine was a natural extension of that, of just the creativity of something from nothing, like whatever it is, sewing, baking, farming, you know, I just was sort of always drawn to that aspect. Um, and so I, it was sort of a natural fit of, um, you know, like obviously my parents were, were, you know, great parents. They're really good, you know, mentors in that way where they've always given me a lot of good, you know, life and professional advice. Um, but yeah, when it came time to pick a college, then I thought, okay, yeah, Davis is great. My sister already goes here too. I've been to the campus a lot. Love it. Um, I'll try the winemaking program, and if I change my mind, I'll already have a lot of units in, you know, chemistry and calculus, and I can change to pre-med or whatever, you know, um, but that moment never came to change. I always liked it. I was always drawn to what was happening next, what I was learning, my professors, um, you know, I especially love Roger Bolton and Hildegard Heyman were some of the most formative professors for me that really taught me how to think about wine, how to think about technology, like what are we, what are we tasting, what are these flavors, and being really intentional about how you think about what you do as a winemaker. So that was really like the kickoff was having some really incredible professors as well. Um, after that, I knew I wanted to travel. I wanted to work a few places around the world. Get, you know, I was <laughs> 22 years old. I wanted to, you know, and I had come from Calistoga, a 5,000 person town. And then, you know, my next biggest experience was the cow town of Davis. So it was, so I, I was ready for something, you know, bigger and to, to leave. Um, so I went to work in Austria at a winery in Vienna, um, which I picked it exactly for that reason. I, it, how often do you get to work in wine and live in a major city? So that was really, really appealing to me. Um, but little did I know how much I would learn there about really technical winemaking. Uh, my boss uh, was Dragos Pavlescu. He is Romanian and a very, he has a PhD. He's a very mad scientist type and he's just so smart. And we, uh, we're still really good friends to this day. We still trade research papers back and forth and we call and check up on each other every harvest of what are you seeing? Like what's new, you know? Um, so he taught me a lot about, um, well, you know, just how technical winemaking can be, how much stuff you can fix when you have subpar fruit, because not everywhere gets as amazing weather as Napa Valley. So I, we, we cleaned up some, some pretty gnarly stuff, um, which was really cool to see in practice of how good wines can be from fruit that doesn't look that great. Um, and then after I worked in Australia as well, and then came back to Napa and I worked at Opus One, I did their phenolic maturity research project. And so um, my two bosses there were also very, um, helped me a lot in my career. Lucia Solis was the enologist at the time and she really upped my lab skills, super, super technical, precise. Um, and I really felt like she invested a lot in me of like, she really pushed for, you know, interns usually weren't really that involved with blending, but I was trying really hard. And so she, she let me help with a lot of those th things too, which was great. Uh, and then Michael, who I'm sure a lot of you know, Michael Salachi, um, he is just a very kind, thoughtful person. And he spends so much more time and energy, like teaching the interns and spending time with us than he like needed to. You know, he would take us up to lunch. He spent a lot of time with us one on one, really making sure that we were getting the most out of the experience. And so that was really great for me to make the most of that experience, but also helped me to see like how to really be a good boss, how to take care of people who work for you. Like um, interns put everything into this job and like you really want them to come away with a lot too. So I've tried to really incorporate or incorporate that into my own management style. Um, I hope it's working. Um, 
And, um, and then I worked for Joel Gott for seven years, um, which what's funny for, you know, Gott is really, Joel is sort of the face of the brand, but behind the scenes, that whole team is mostly women. Um, so Sarah Gott is, you know, the director of winemaking and Elisa Jacobson was my direct boss. She's the vice president of winemaking. And, you know, that is a really powerful brand. We made so much wine. We made wine, you know, all over the place. I was exposed to so many things. I really learned a lot there. Um, And that really gets into where, you know, winemaking is so much more than the actual skill of just, you know, making wine. Like there's all kinds of negotiations and contracts, organization, logistics, trucking, storage, you know, like there's just so many aspects to it that like I learned a ton working there. And um, yeah, and Elisa and Sarah were really, really good at, um, at helping me strengthen those skills. And then uh, next jump in 2017, um, after, well, I had my first daughter, um, Ben Rosie, who's now almost four. Um, and so then I was kind of ready to look to do something a little bit different too. I started a couple working on a different projects with my mom, which was fun to think about, like for how well known my mom is, like we only started really working directly together and working on blends and things, um, in the last couple of years, which has been, um, really cool since she and I see so eye to eye on a lot of flavors and a lot of style directions. And so, um, so I love working with my mom. She's just like exactly as good as, you know, you, you might think she's just so incredibly talented and really decisive. She just has so much experience that, um, I, I still am learning things all the time from her and we, we talk pretty much every day. Um, and then now at Matera as well, um, I also work with the consulting winemaker who his name is Mike Trujillo and um, some of you might know him as well. He's awesome guy. You know, he is just the, the best attitude and has so much experience in a lot of different fields and a new category for me too that I'm still learning with Matera is how to be on the side of a custom crush facility where I, now I'm the one dealing with clients. And so now it's a whole new world of, you know, interpersonal stuff too that, Mike has given me a lot of really, really good counsel on that as well. So um, I love working with all of these people. It's, it's just been a lot of fun. So that's my nutshell of people who've really inspired me. So I think what's, what's interesting is that you've had what I like to call the kaleidoscope um, of people in your corner, but also encouraging you. And it yeah. sounds like your parents let you just kind of be and figure it out and that you kind of knew from the very beginning that it was going to be something that was agricultural whether it was winemaking or however it was going to be something that was agricultural and I think so as I spoke to everyone um beforehand to hear everyone's story you know I was even I was really taken with Evan's story as well, because everyone's story is so different. Evan, tell us about you and how you got started and your mentors and what your life has been like like as well and your journey. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tonya, for that. Um, Yeah, I grew up in New Jersey, which is uh, very different from the two other uh, winemakers here. Um, who grew up in uh, the Napa Valley area, Um, I didn't know uh, that you could be a winemaker growing up. So uh, I grew up right outside New York City. My mother uh, is a perfumer and my dad always collected wine. So, um, you know, sitting around the dinner table is very European in the respect that uh, there was wine, there was good food, and then we talked about it. Um, And then I always got to taste. So um, it was really amazing having two people who knew different aspects of maybe what a wine would give. So my mom saying what her sensory, uh, you know, aromatically, what she is talking about. And then my dad, of course, who's bringing maybe more of the flavor profiles. And that was our dinner conversation. Um, And it was just, I guess, my entry into oh, this is, this is wine and it's so much deeper than uh, just a liquid. Um, it has so much more to offer, which was really interesting. So, um, so my mom being a perfumer, I, uh, my mom would bring home perfumes that she was working on um, and I would be blending those together, which I'm sure she didn't like at all. 
Um, but I would be doing kind of my own little mixtures and calling them something weird and, uh, you know, thinking I was doing something really interesting and cool. Um, but that really gave me a sense of how things go together, right? Which is a lot of winemaking as well, you know? Um, so that was another kind of entry level, uh, younger version of, uh, of kind of experiencing what, what could be done later on. Um, I went to uh, Boston University, which I thought um, I was gonna go for school of hospitality. I was playing soccer at the time. Um, I got accepted to the school to play soccer. Um, and of course, through my love of food and wine and things of that nature, I thought I was going to go into the restaurant industry. So hospitality school um, really called to me. Um, and uh, through then, I, or through that program, I was able to take uh, wine courses, which was my first real introduction as to classic kind of winemaking and tutelage on blind tasting and things of that nature. Um, and understanding more about how grapes are grown, um, different regions, um, all sorts of different things. And I was good at it. It was something that um, I could pick up really fast. Um, so I was like, oh, okay, wine. We're still going on the restaurant path. Um, and my first job out of, uh, out of school was working for Per Se um, in Manhattan with uh, the Thomas Keller Restaurant Group. So um, again, I really thought the restaurant path was where I wanted to go. Um, and then after kind of experiencing that, which was just an incredible um, kind of overall experience about business, precision, um, I mean, all of that really helped me move forward and realize that the restaurant industry was great, but it takes a very specific type of person and that was not me. And I really wanted to uh, experience maybe what winemaking was like. And at that point, I realized that that was actually a career path. Um, so I had a friend who was going to the uh, Culinary Institute here in St. Helena, who I went to school with. And uh, we were talking back and forth and she said, you know what, you should just do it. So I moved out Christmas day, 2009 uh, to Napa Valley, really on a whim. Uh, and, uh, and a few bucks in my pocket and, uh, and tried to make it work. So um, throughout the contacts I had at restaurants and different sommeliers, um, I reached out to probably 50 different people. It was the dead of winter. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and, uh, and I met a lot of really great people, one of which was uh, Chris Vandendresch of uh, White Rock Vineyards. Um, and he was the first person that really gave me my start in this industry, um, kind of just on personality alone, um, which was really amazing uh, of him to do. So no resume whatsoever in winemaking, but he thought that, uh, that maybe I could help him out. Um, and just like Chelsea, I really had uh, male and female mentors uh, throughout my kind of climbing the ladder here in, in Napa Valley. And um, and I can't say enough about you know, both sides, um, which was super incredible. Um, so I started there and then he said, you know what, you're not too annoying, you work really hard. Let me, uh, let me uh, talk to my friends over at Sainsbury Winery um, that can uh, maybe give you an internship next year. So um, I became the, in the uh, viticulture intern at Sainsbury. Uh, that was my first uh, real, real paid job uh, here in, in Napa Valley. And it just, I mean, my mind exploded. Um, I think I'm getting chills just speaking about it right now because I really fell in love with the process, fell in love with farming, fell in love kind of with all these different aspects. Um, and I met such a great group of people there. Uh, Jerome Cherie, uh, who was a winemaker at the time, um, is still one of my very good friends. Uh, Chris Kajani, um, again, female mentor. Uh, she's still such an incredible force in my life. Uh, Remy Cohen, who was the consulting viticulture, uh, or consulting in viticulture, um, she was my direct boss, and uh, and she again was someone who I still look up to in every sort of way. Um, she probably is laughing right now if she's listening because she was probably like, oh, you know, I was just doing my thing. Um, but she had such a, a great impact. Um, all these people had such a great impact in my life, and who I call very close friends. Um, still to this day. Um, and then uh, I was able to work at 
CV Winery, uh, that same harvest where I met uh, Jeremy Weintraub. Um, and he, again, it, it was just me and him in the cellar. Um, just an incredible experience of him kind of guiding me on estate winemaking um, and uh, in growing uh, estate grapes, um, which is something I do right now, Crocker and Star. So, um, and then he led me to New Zealand where I made wine there at a very small place in uh, central Chicago. Um, and then Remy, of course, came calling and, uh, and I started uh, in viticulture at um, Cliff Lady Vineyards. And, uh, and she really, again, super mentor. Um, she was also climbing the ladder there as I was at the same time. And uh, she saw something in me at Sainsbury and I uh, wanted to bring me on and I grew there. I, I spent the, le the, uh, the next four years there as the enologist. And, um, and then from there was the assistant winemaker of Encarneros, the two consulting winemakers, uh, working more with Custom Crush and different brands. Um, so again, super fascinating, again, a different uh, direction, um, but uh, something that we all, you know, need to learn and, and uh, we're two really great people there as well. And then, of course, coming to Crocker and Star, where uh, Pam Star is a force to be reckoned with in winemaking and um, just a really amazing uh, woman to learn from, uh, from uh, the winemaking perspective. I mean, um, that was the drive in taking on uh, this position. And now, um, you know, I have taken over for her as winemaker and continue on with that legacy. Um, and uh, the depth of knowledge that she has uh, is just incredible. So I just feel really fortunate, again, that um, every single one of these people have influenced me in such an impactful way. Um, and have made me who I am today as a manager. Chelsea, you kind of touched upon that, super huge. Um, and, uh, and certainly as a winemaker and a taster and, um, and all that culminates to, to where I am now. So I can't be more thankful. So Dahlia, your story as well. Yes. And thank you so much for having me. I feel so honored. I mean, ladies, I bow down to you and what you, your adventures and journeys, it's, it's so inspiring. So I thank you, uh, Tanya, for also um, um, hosting this event. And so my story, I am the daughter of immigrant parents from Mexico, born from the states of Jalisco and Michoacan. I'm fourth generation Mexican American, and I identify myself as being a Latina next gen who speaks English, Spanish, and Spanglish. My family firsthand beat, beat the odds, overcame challenges um, to go from vineyard workers, campesinos, farm workers, picking grapes during harvest time, to vineyard owners, to eventually winery owners within less than 50 years. This has been our definition of the American dream. I am proud to be part of one of the pioneering Mexican American families to launch a wine production company in Napa Valley. Um, as a millennial Latina, for me, it's been so crucial to find success and meaning um, by working with inspiring businesses, other companies, communities, and truly it's that passion of confidence in which other businesses and communities and people which have inspired me to be who I am today. Um, education, I would say, would be the forefront of my excellence to succeed. After high school, I went to San Francisco, San Francisco State University and got my undergraduate degree in organizational communications and marketing. For me, my passions were definitely about storytelling and marketing and branding and interweaved such fantastic classes um, that encouraged just interpersonal like findings. And after I graduated from San Francisco State University, I embarked on a almost seven month backpacking journey throughout South America, um, interweaving the wine industry in Chile and Argentina. So my almost light bulb moment went off in 2009, um, when I realized that, wow, I have a family winery small business in Napa Valley. This is something that I wanna be a part of. It's a no brainer, you know, surrounded by 
world-class food, wine, culture, and really bringing about our rich Mexican heritage and culture. So who has inspired me personally? Uh, for me in the wine industry, uh, I knew at a very early age what my family was doing and embarking on was something super special. I remember being five, six, seven years old, running through our Pinot Noir vineyards at our Napa Carneros estate, following the harvest crew and the tractors and picking up the fallen grape clusters and throwing them back into the bins. And at that age, I was like, wow, this is something really special that you don't really see, you know, or hear very often. And for me, um, my inspiration truly came from my mom, my own mama, uh, Amelia Moran Ceja. She was elected to be the first Mexican-American Mexican woman to be president of a wine production company in the U.S., elected by her partners in 1999. And that's when Ceja Vineyards was formed. Her passion for the wine industry and zest for cooking has made her an iconic leading woman in the wine industry. And I'm just so proud to call her my mom. Uh, like so many other inspiring stories that you ladies have shared today, um, it was no cakewalk for her either. Uh, she immigrated from Mexico, from Jalisco, from a little tiny village called Las Flores in 1967. She was 12 years old. She didn't know a word of English. And similarly, my father, Pedro Ceja, he immigrated from Michoacan, and the two of them met in the Napa Valley picking grapes in Oakville. And as they say, the rest is history. I can touch more about that later, but my mom has shared so many um, stories with me about her upbringing in Mexico and her journey um, to the U.S. And as a young woman, um, she shared a very personal story that she grew up in a little town where there was no running water electricity. In order to, you know, wash their clothes, they had to take the local burro or donkey to carry their clothes um, to the nearby river to wash them and take showers, like to bathe. To bathe. And so she didn't grow up with wealth or material items, but she was surrounded by so much love by her maternal grandmother, Mama Chepa, and her mama, Mama Kika, that, who also taught her the, the art of cooking which is something that we are so passionate here about at Seha Vineyards. Fast forward to the early 1980s after my parents' love story transpired into a marriage and collectively with my uncle Armando, our now winemaker, who graduated from UC Davis and got a degree in both viticulture and enology, the three of them, including my grandparents, my dad's parents, purchased our very first property at our Napa Carneros estate, 20 acres. And the dream of planning a, a vineyard and one day owning a winery slowly became a reality for our family. I was a young teen when Seha Vineyards was founded in 1999. Out of the three partners and founders, my mom was the only one that quit her job and started Seha Vineyards from scratch. At the time, I mean, I was a teenager. I didn't fully understand the sacrifice that she was enduring in order to start a business. I can recall countless times throughout middle school and high school where she would miss several soccer games and school activities. During this time is when I realized what an impact she was making on me and who I was supposed to be late, later down in life. And being, as we like to say, a hungry mujer chingona or a badass woman, um, raising three kids and building a brand at the same time, I mean, it's, it's really her hard work ethic, her passion, her drive that inspired me. And she's always instilled, um, you know, those work ethic um, sort of focused um, inspirations for me to do exactly just that. One pivotal moment that really stands out to me that she told me when she was first starting in the wine industry um, in 1999, around there, she was mentored um, by another winemaker in the industry um, through various, through another um, Vintners Association that we were a part of. And one big challenge she had to endure that still sort of, I, I just still can't believe it, is this mentor told her, she's like, he's like, you know, A, two things. Authentic Mexican cuisine doesn't pair well with wine and B, people of color don't have the discretionary income to buy wine. 
oh my God, like, wow, A, she is a woman of color and B, like, wow. So she had to fight a lot of hurdles to get to where she is, but she fought that battle. It almost lit a fire under her to get to where she is today and honestly to be her most authentic self. And so for me, she's taught me so much confidence and to really have a voice in this community. And that's been so inspiring for me. And my passions in this industry is branding and marketing and storytelling. And so how can we be our most authentic self, you know, within Seha Vineyards with our personal branding? And that's something um, as a legacy that I'm moving, wanting to share and move forward with the next generation, which is something so special for me as a new mama um, last year. Um, our daughter, Luna Isabella, was born during the pandemic. So talk about one of the most challenging years in my personal life. And, and to think that now my own daughter is immersed in such a beautiful time where we can really make change as women and have a voice um, is something so special for me. And, you know, we talk, I talk a lot about passion and passion is one of my favorite things about my mom who's mentored me. And, you know, she's, she's only five feet tall, but when she walks in the room, her energy just explodes and just fills the room with such positive energy in such an inspiring way. Um, but now I'm excited to share that our family is officially on the brink of breaking ground to build our Seha Vineyards. Uh, Napa Carneros Estate uh, Mission Inspired H Hospitality Center and Winery. And this is truly just the beginning and talking about legacy. It's like, what do we want to leave behind is, you know, for us truly inter intertwining our rich Mexican culture, our passions of food and wine pairing and making balanced wines uh, for that matter. And I must say the future looks very bright. And I applaud all of you for sharing your story. And I just... I feel so inspired daily now by, by everyone and by the things you've said. So thank you so much. And I look forward to sharing a glass with all of you, hopefully in the near future. You know, we're all women and we all come from different walks of life and different backgrounds. Um, but at the end of the day, we're all here to help one another and to get things done. Um, and listening to everyone's story, yeah, we all had the kaleidoscope of people. We had men and we had women to help us along the way. But the main thing now is all of the women that are helping each other to push and propel us forward and how we're pushing and propelling and propelling everyone else to do the same, you know? Mm -hmm. And for myself, I had both male and female mentors as well, but the push and propel to put me where I am for the light bulb to go off, not even thinking that this was something that I could do or wanted to do, it's been women. And my male mentors pop up as well and are still around, you know, but this has been really lovely and we're not done yet. And we've got wine. So <laughs> first wine is, um, your wine, Chelsea, the Matera, Oak Knoll District, Viognier, 2019 from Napa Valley, which is Good. absolutely delicious. It's got that kind of spice that you get from Viognier, um, that honeysuckle, acacia honey and, and flowers, but there's this minerality that is pulsating through and just layered upon layered upon layered. I guess everyone's saying, how does she know that? We didn't see her taste anything. <laughs> so I took a sip earlier um, just to make sure everything was as it should be in all our glasses. It's delicious. Thank you, Tonya. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. I, I love Viognier and um, I picked it to share with you guys today because um, just something a little bit different. I mean, I wanted to highlight again, like I really do love the farming aspect. And so now um, I feel like I just feel so lucky to be in Matera. We have, you know, a 55 acre property and I walk it every single day and I love it. I'm so in my element of like after lunch or in the morning when it gets, you know, when it's hotter in the summer, I walk that property every day and just observe how much it's changing and kind of, you know, really pay attention. And, you know, I always, you know, usually carry 
um, like vineyard tape with me and hot pink so I can mark if there's something strange that I need to point out to our vineyard team, you know, so I, I just love it. Our Viognier block is um, definitely a little bit temperamental as Viognier can be, so it needs some extra attention. Um, but I love it as a varietal um, because it's, you don't see it very much. I mean, I just saw in the crush report too, there's not a lot of Viognier in Napa and I think it's really tasty. So, um, and I love how much of it just shines through without really, um, you know, there's, it's all in neutral barrels. There's no real oak component to it. Um, but I do, you know, stir the leaves. So I kind of build some of that creaminess, but I tend to like my whites on the, the very acidic side. So I really want that tension between that creaminess and that acid. Um, and I just love the nose of Vienna. Exactly. Tonya, you're spot on with the honeysuckle. And like, I always get a little bit of cantaloupe and, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm a Viognier fan and um, I hope it's something that kind of gathers in popularity with time, but I know most people don't even know to really look for it. Well, you know, those that are Francophiles are people that usually, you know, drink Contreu. Hey, there you go. One of my favorites. That's, yeah, it's, you know, <laughs> Viognier. But this is really, really tasty. And, you know, when we think of Oak Knoll, we think of, you know, red wine, not necessarily white coming from that district either, which is a mixture of, you know, cool and warm climate and gets some shade um, as well. That's delicious. Thanks. Yeah, I would say we definitely know a lot of our neighbors in Matera too. Our, our most popular white is probably Chardonnay. Um, but we make some, we make some Sauvignon Blanc as well. And I'm kind of, you know, pushing for a few more unusual things. I'm hoping for some Albarino and that we're planning, planting this year actually. Um, but yeah, no, it's a good Chardonnay spot as well, but Viognier, it does, it does really well there. And, you know, Evan Crocker and Star, you know, when you told me that Pam had pretty much kind of, you know, retired and it's, it's all you, this has always been one of my favorite uh, Cap Francs, Crocker and Star, uh, St. Helena, Napa Valley, 2018. Yeah, oh my God, this is uh, definitely one of the reasons why uh, I started working here. Um, Pam started this company on 100 cases of Cabernet Franc, a super obscure kind of solo variety to start a company off of. Um, and thanks to a lot of great sommeliers like yourself, it really took to this wine and uh, Crocker and Star kind of exploded. Um, and now, you know, I consider this Cabernet Franc to, to really be uh, the base of, of what Cabernet Franc is supposed to taste like in Napa Valley. Um, and that's kind of what I was introduced to. Um, and 18 was just an amazing year in general. Um, and this Cabernet Franc expresses everything that you would think Cabernet Franc should be. So it has that like south of the border spice, uh, super round tannins, very luxurious, um, and also extremely aromatic. You kind of have that gravel component, minerality. Um, you know, Chelsea talked about tension. That is uh, our estate completely. So we're all estate. Um, this comes from about three different blocks on the property, um, fermented alone, and then uh, they come together in a blend. After that's decided, about 22 months in barrel. Um, it sees about 60 to 70 percent new oak, uh, kind of dependent on on the year. And uh, yeah, this is just, I mean, the quintessential Cabernet Franc for me. Um, it's just really beautiful, perfume, and yeah, really elegant. And um, you know, as we sit here and talk about all of this, your mom, Evan, being a perfumer, and you playing around with perfume and making blends and here you are, you know, making and blending. I know. Wine. I know, yeah. It's all <laughs> kind of like came together uh, and made a lot of sense as to why I'm, I am where I am. Um, but as we know, blending is, is an extremely important part of kind of the finalized wines um, and really kind of make, make it what it is in a lot of ways. Um, and understanding the balance of that um, certainly came from that experience along with all the other experiences I've had. You know, Chelsea, you talked about 
sitting at the table with Michael Salachi um, and being, you know, the intern that was allowed to, to blend. You know, I also had those experiences where I was blending with a lot of people that I didn't realize I was going to have the opportunity to. And I think it comes from passion and drive and, and, you know, expressing interest and things of that nature. So, I mean, uh, aromatics are so important to me. And I think any wine kind of has to explode out of the glass in order for anyone to be interested. And then all of the other flavors have to match that. So really making sure that your blends are doing that is, uh, is paramount. Well done, Evan. This is delicious. I mean, this is about like as good as it gets for Cab Franc. It's so true to the varietal, but just elevated. I mean, it, it's really, really seamless and delicious. Thank you. I appreciate that. And you're, by the way, I, I didn't want to overstep, but the Viognier is super beautiful. It has, again, that honeysuckle, uh, great minerality. I love the tension. I'm also that type of person who just like loves a really amazing acid balance in in the wines. I think that really makes or breaks a wine. Um, and you just did that so beautifully. Um, I, oh, just, thank you so much. Yeah, just really, really incredible. So I, I hope to buy some for sure. Yay, good, thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, I was like, hmm, yeah. And Evan, I must say that later on, we're gonna be enjoying some carne con chile and this. There you go. Gonna be delicious. No, I think so too. Yeah. I'll pass off to both of you the Viognier, which personally, Chelsea, I love. So thank you for sharing such delicious wines, you guys. Thank you so much. And now I want chile con carne. <laughs> yes, I know, right? <laughs> and all the black olive and crushed herbs and, you know, black fruits that are there. Yeah. Um, and the Cap Franc, it's, it's delicious. And of, of course, crushed gravel, mineral, but it's mouth-watering. I it just is. want another sip and I want something to eat. Exactly. Right now, and Dahlia, you know, Seha, Cabernet Sauvignon, which it's uh, 2015 that we have in our glass. Super, super excited about this. 15 was a really fantastic vintage as well. And thank you for sharing this with us tonight. We got a little bit of age over here. Yes, absolutely. Salud. Um, it was since Valentine's Day was, was right around the corner a few weeks back, we did a really fun chocolate and wine pairing. Mm -hmm. And we paired our um, 2015 Napa Valley, 100% Napa Valley cab with a variety of delicious chocolates. And this one to me, um, as far as food and wine pairing goes, mole. If you ever have an opportunity to have an authentic Mexican mole poblano paired with cab, it's to die for. I mean, our cab, it's luscious. You get a lot of this blackberry, dark chocolate. It's, it's very velvety. Tannins are present, but it's not over the top. Um, this, it was aged for a little over 36 months in mostly neutral French oak. Um, this vineyard comes from a 10 and a half acre parcel just south of the San district. And as I say in the Valley, Cab is King, it's no different for us. It's just so well balanced and approachable. Food friendly, it stands well alone, but complements so many fantastic dishes as well. You know, the first thing people would think is, oh, it's Cab, okay, I wanna have it, you know, steak, hamburger, but because it's so supple and there's so many layers there as well, I would put this with, pork or even a meaty fish you know some ahi tuna there we go you know some swordfish yes <laughs> and that is something that we are always looking to do is look outside of the box as far as food and wine pairings as I mentioned a few minutes ago mole but I mean this with your yeah. arrachera you know skirt steak I mean with your frijoles um there was an article that came out a few years ago. It was beans and Cabernet, you know, and it <laughs> truly has revolutionized this idea because, you know, you pair a protein with Cab and it's, it's just such a beautiful pairing. And so we always want to educate and expand people's um, perspectives about food and wine pairings. And I think my mom also has done such a phenomenal job of, of encouraging just that. And my uncle, Armando Seja, our winemaker, for making consistent, balanced wines. 
um, that really do speak of the birthplace, the vineyards. And so it's, it's a pleasure to share our 2015 Seha Vineyards Napa Valley Cab. Yeah, this wine is really beautiful. It has that savory component that you're referring to. And, and just, I mean, 2015, I love those wines. They're, again, we're talking about tension. Like there was tension in that, <laughs> in that year. And I, when I first started Crocker and Star and blended the 2015s and I was just completely blown away. I mean, I think in a lot of respects, it gets a bad rap. Um, because it's kind of pigeonholed between uh, 14 and 16, which are definitely like more fruit forward uh, vintages, maybe more people pleasers. But this 15s to me are just really beautiful. I mean, there's floral quality in this. And again, that's this is making me want to eat some of that food you were talking about. <laughs> I know me I too, for sure. This is definitely really, um, like the first thing that I got when I smelled this, which like, it doesn't always jump at me for cab is like how vibrant this is. I get a little bit of orange peel too, where it's just, there's a lot of fruit in here. And um, I definitely, <laughs> um, yeah, I would love this with a barbecue too. And so it just, yeah, you're just making me hungry of like all of these things <laughs> of thinking about like how much, um, well, again, and how much I want to socialize with people too. I'm like, yes, I am ready for delicious, delicious food and um, to drink this wine. Yeah, exactly. Well, I cannot wait to have you guys over to Seha Vineyards Casa Seha for a scrumptious meal and wine pairing. I love that. Sounds good. Yeah. So ladies, we've got some questions and, you know, we've all had conversations together as well. First one is for Chelsea and Chelsea, you and I had this conversation about your family and your background and your upbringing and your mom being this and your family in general being really famous winemakers and within the community. Our first question um, from an anonymous attendee, Chelsea, how do you feel like your family and clear place of privilege helped boost your career? networking it's all about networking obviously and so i've met you know lots of other winemakers over the year like that's you know my parents friends from college are all winemakers too of you know people i've known my whole life um and so i mean that is how like i've been very active in my technical association napa valley wine technical group uh and so when i was on you know home between internships um after well i was i was home from austria about to go work in australia and i came as a guest of my mom's to the technical group i met michael Salachi there and then we started talking and that's how i ended up with an internship internship there so like really for anybody like i think it doesn't even matter who your parents are like network it's absolutely all about networking of like you know you just never know who you're going to meet that's going to connect you to somebody else that will have, you know, a really good opportunity for you. And so this question is for everybody. I'd love to know how all the panelists try to take the things they've learned from their mentors and carry them, carry them on to impact their current and future mentees. Anybody want to take that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Um, yeah, I, again, have had such great mentors, uh, male and female, like I spoke about before, and I'm always thinking about um, how I was treated um, and what I could do either better or the same. Um, so how I thrived um, because of them and how uh, they brought me to the table and gave me a chance. And, um, and I certainly want my interns or the people that I work with to be better um, on the next, you know, next stage of their life. And I want to elevate their experience, their profession in any way possible. So um, I am where I am because of all these people. And I hope one day, you know, I'll be mentioned in this because of uh, those aspects as well. So I, I really take uh, that to heart and, and try my hardest to make an impact on, on these other people who are learning as well. You know, I think we all, we lead by example. And I think having this conversation that we're having tonight is, is a testament to that. You know, we're not just talking it, we're walking it um, and doing it. 
And I think more or less all of us pretty much have an open door policy of, of trying to help people if someone has a question um, about what to do next, if they're in the industry or if they're wanting to segue um, from what they're doing already in the industry, you know, the best way to, to do that is to maybe work a harvest to figure out if it's really what you want to do. You know, working a harvest lets you know whether or not winemaking is, is for you. Um, and I'm going to segue into this question for Evan. Hi, Evan. I love your story and I have a similar upbringing and I am in restaurants as a pastry chef. You said that restaurant industry folks are very specific types of people and I agree, but I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that. I'm thinking of switching careers to be a winemaker. What aspect of your personality slash skill set made winemaking perfect for you? And that person is uh, Rachel Manor. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Um, I think that is a really interesting uh, question. Um, I think um, what I mean by a specific type of person in the restaurant industry is that you work really hard and you can um, balance your family life extremely well. Uh, in your personal life, personal life, because you are working extremely long hours and during the times when most, uh, I guess, social times occur. Um, but the similarities are, are actually, you know, there are a lot of them because as winemakers, we work kind of around the clock as well, um, especially during harvest time, but also not during harvest time. Uh, in any typical year, we would be traveling or uh, really having a lot to do with marketing and things of that nature, uh, customer facing. So there are a lot of similarities between being in the Russian industry and being in winemaking. So I do think that there is a clear path for you to move. Uh, and actually what I look for in interns typically is if they do have any hospitality experience or working in restaurants because they're able to understand kind of what pivoting means, um, long days, um, lifting heavy things, constantly cleaning, um, but also having a taste for things. So understanding the balance of food, understanding the balance of different wines, um, cleanliness being, again, a super key aspect. So Rachel, if you're interested in an internship, reach out because <laughs> I would love to uh, be the first one to introduce you to this industry. That's what I'm doing. So, Another question from Jessica Reed. A lot has been written about how millennials are not interested in wine. Similarly, why women are often portrayed as wine consumers, it's not often as connoisseurs are acknowledged as having any expertise. Have you experienced uh, these misconceptions and how do you best overcome these misperceptions? That's a tough one because I certainly can't speak for all millennials. I mean, that's if there's anything that we know about millennials is that we are the most diverse generation that's ever existed. And there are a lot of us as well. Um, so yes, even if you know a, a large percentage of millennials don't care about wine and are you know into um, you know sort of these malt beverages that are popular, white claw and things like that. Um, there still are a huge number of individuals that really are passionate about wine and care a lot. Um, and I'm missing the next part of the question I have to read. How have you experienced these misconceptions? How do you overcome them? Um, well, I mean, overcoming them, I guess, is not really my job. Like, my job is just to keep doing a good, good job, make good wine, and then, you know, try to share it with people. Um, and no matter how old you are, no matter if you're a millennial or what, like it's, we're going to find people that care, that are interested in, in having good wine. We just got to keep pushing. We got to keep trucking. We got to keep doing what we do, you know, to, to break those misconceptions because there are those out of there, but some of those people are always just going to be naysayers anyway. Right. You know, and Hey, 
White Claw <laughs> and those malt beverages is the gateway to get people into beer, <laughs> into cocktails, you know, into wine. You know, and I'll say, I, I don't think that the old way of thinking that millennials don't care anything about wine and they don't think anything about wine, I think that is very quickly, you know, coming to a close or that that loop is closing um, because there are so many ways for us to get information. Um, the internet is a super fantastic thing. Social platforms is a super fantastic thing. And it's connecting so many different people from all different walks um, of life. There's a question here for me, Tonya. What was your experience like being a Samoye as a black woman? And what advice do you have for women of color following in your footsteps? And that's from Andrea Early. Andrea, I always tell people that are looking to change and looking to get into the wine industry, whether it is as a, a sommelier um, or as a winemaker, the first thing is, if there's someone that you admire, reach out to them. There's something that used to happen a long time ago and it was called information interviews. And that's how you figure out if it's something that you really wanna do, A. Second, if it is something that you really wanna do, you can then tap that person and ask them for advice and the possibility of that person becoming your mentor is more highly likely than not, you know? But the wonderful thing about now is that there's all these tools for all of us. There are all these organizations that are helping to push and propel um, everything forward. Wine Unify, um, the Roots Fund, uh, Napa Valley Vintners Association. If you wanna take classes and learn something new, San Francisco uh, Wine School, Napa Valley um, Ac Wine Academy. There's all these different places to go to get more information and to get your feet wet. Um, Black Wine Professionals. There's, there's a lot of, of places to go and at your fingertips to, to find information. Um, the really fun thing is to be able to check out some of these platforms of people that are in the industry that are holding you know, video sessions with winemakers all over the world, um, talking about their craft and what they do and just really exposing people to what wine is all about. And I think that is also propelling things further for all of us, millennials, people that are just from all walks of life. It's really, it's really an exciting time, you know, right now, it really is. Um, Kathleen Van Winkle, if you could tell your younger self fresh into the wine industry, your career, what would you say? What advice would you give yourself now that you've kind of been here and you're in it? The hindsight thing, what would you say? Well, I <laughs> Keep going. Well, taste everything, no travel but honestly don't be afraid to ask for help sometimes from your mentors I remember being in my early 20s fresh out of college and I forgot to add that I did uh, receive my executive MBA from Sonoma State University after I came back from South America but sometimes you just need to seek out your peers, your colleagues, specific questions in any regards. Don't be afraid to ask for help. If you have any questions and explore, like now is the time to explore your palate, explore your, your mind, your education. 
Um, and that's why for me personally, I sought out seeking a higher education to get my executive MBA at Sonoma State University. But, you know, in the wine industry, you are always learning. It's an ever evolving industry, which I find so fascinating. And be confident, you know, in yourself and be your most authentic self. That's what I would say. Authenticity goes a long way. You know, people know when you're not being that, you know, they, they really do. It comes through and, and um, people respect you for being much more authentic than not. You know, I think all of us are our authentic selves, you know, within what we do. And I think if we, if we weren't that, I don't think we'd all be here sitting at this table computer screen um, having this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. So Jenna Olson, I'm with Vivian. This is an inspiring night being with you all. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you and loving the tasting. Might any of you address a neater or major rough patch that one of your mentors coached you through or a time when you called their gifts to mind to get you through? So what piece of advice did your mentors give you that really helped you get through a rough patch that you stumbled upon or hit within your journey? Because I know everything hasn't been roses. <laughs> hasn't been for me either, you know, for, for the wants, most part, right? Who wants but, to take this one on? <laughs> That's tough. I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's really hard to say. Like, I, I would say like my first harvest, like when I, when I worked in Austria, um, like I, it was, um, I was super, super lonely. It was really hard. I like, I was, you know, living, um, living by myself and like the cellar there was from the 1600s and, you know, Vienna is farther north, it gets dark early. And so basically I was like a mole person of like, I would go to work when it was dark out and then I would work underground all day. And then I would come home in the dark and it like, I was like, you know, kind of, it takes a toll. Like when you live in darkness on like on, um, you know, um, on how, how your ability to be happy. And so it was really, I was struggling, you know, and it was something where I would call home and my mom was just like, okay, there's no shame. in like, if you want to come home, if you know, if it's like, if you're too sad. And then I was, I was very pig headed about the experience as well. I'm like, I said, oh my God, I'm not quitting on my first harvest. I'm like, you know, like that was, it was, um, something that I really had to muscle through, but like my mom was really, really supportive emotionally for, what a hard time I was having of like that it was it was tough you know but it was something where I was just like I was my own sort of like you know my my fear of failure really like made me push through it um yeah and and my mom really helped me I think fear of fear of failure is why we push through everything right um and it doesn't even have to be this huge um big thing, this big hurdle either. Um, Evan, has there been anything that you've worked through within winemaking and on your journey that you thought, I'm just not quite sure, you know, how to get through this and what's the, the best route to take to do this? Yeah, I mean, I think we all have that moment maybe within any um, career path um, of, am I on the right path? Um, because there's adversity and I don't know how to deal with it. Um, and again, I've had those moments, of course, because they're tough and you're trying to, uh, survive, but also trying to, to be successful and be your best self. And sometimes you're just not your best self, um, with different scenarios. Um, so again, I think, uh, tapping into, um, your mentors is huge. I mean, I remember doing that when I've hit some rough patches here um, and I've called up people and I've said, hey, have you been through this as well? Um, and what did you do? And I think that was really helpful just to get some perspective, um, especially women in that regard of, 
hey, uh, what do I do in this scenario? How, how did you handle that? I mean, I think it's super important. Um, and, you know, tapping into resources like moms, for instance, which, you know, uh, all of us have really felt have been mentors to us. I mean, I think that's huge too. I mean, we all come from working moms, which uh, maybe at some point in time was rare. Um, but I mean, my mom worked full time um, and having that conversation with her, maybe at those times, how did you push through? How did you uh, become who you are? And in a time maybe that wasn't perfect for women climbing the ladder. Um, and it's super fascinating to hear and it's really helpful. So I think, um, you know, that's really pushed me, pushed me through for sure. And as we are on this subject, Dahlia, how amazing, fourth generation Mexicana. <laughs> what are your thoughts about your daughter going into the wine industry and what advice would you give her? And you and I have already talked about this, so I already, <laughs> already know. Oh my goodness. Well, tonight uh, there's three generation of Ceja Latina women or Ceja Suedelson for Luna Isabela. Uh, my daughter will be uh, nine months. Oh my goodness, uh, within the next week and a half. But my goodness, this is something so special for me. We're talking about family business, family legacy. What does that mean? I truly just hope to, and what, I'm, what we're doing now is bringing her into a world of equality, of just peace, of enlightenment, of, of what it means to work hard. You know, nothing is handed down. Nothing was handed down to me. Um, my husband and I want to share those values with her. And I really hope that she um, inherits my mama's zest for cooking. <laughs> and um, it's just so special that um, she's amongst, you know, such a united, loving family front, which let's just be honest, family business isn't always that. It's very challenging, um, but also very rewarding. We've had to overcome many hurdles over the past few years. And now that we're on the brink of something so special and something so dynamic, um, collectively together, all of uh, the key team members within the Seha Vineyards family team is united and our visions are aligned in that regard. And so to bring Luna, into that space um, is something really sacred. And this isn't something that I'm gonna push on her like my parents did for me. I will absolutely, and my husband will encourage her to follow her own passions, travel, get an internship. Um, and for me, those experiences is also part of who I am and how I became the person I am today. So I know that's something very valuable for, for her and her future to experience. And if she wants to come back and, you know, work within the family business and time, and we will absolutely um, have that conversation. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a few years down the, down the road. So we have time, but this is a very special time to nurture her in such a, a special time. And especially throughout the past year, throughout the pandemic, we were sheltering in place with my parents, my immediate family, and for her just to um, get a sense of my upbringing and to share that with her has been something so special. So we've got a fun one, guys, guys, ladies. Hey, just for fun, what's your favorite wine and music pairing? Ooh. Mm. For me, it depends upon what I'm drinking, you know? So I think within this, we should think about what's in front of us, you know, right now. I love all kinds of music. So when I'm, when I'm tasting and I'm drinking, Lord only knows what's going to pop into, you know, my mind. Um, if I were going to dive into the white wine, the Viognier, the Matera, I would 
want a cool breeze and some sun. And the girl from Empedina playing in my head with that one, you know. I was just listening mm-hmm. to Brazilian radio earlier. Yeah. I get you. That is awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh yeah. I guess I'd have to think of it really much more as like a. It's hard to just think in general. I would have to go like, okay, what, what, what music would you pair with this one? I would. I have to think about it in a more specific way. But now that you say it that way, like, okay, if we go back to the Viennese, mm-hmm. um, I definitely would think of it as just like me, Lady Gaga, and cooking in my kitchen. See, there you go. Mm-hmm. Different strokes for different folks. <laughs> Evan, where would you be? Where does this wine take you? You know, that's a really great question. I feel like uh, this wine's meant to be shared. So, I mean, COVID times, right? Like, where else can we be? <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think this wine deserves food. So, uh, I think this has to be kind of like an outdoor. Uh, you know, cooking experience with your friends, just kind of, and, and some, and maybe music to match that would be like kind of vibey uh, music with with definitely some uh, strong guitar and um, some good vocals. I mean, I feel like this wine is kind of versatile, um, and you could you could kind of go either way with this. Um, but uh, but yeah, to me, this is like, you know, head bumping. You know, you're kind of you're kind of hanging with your friends. Okay, cool. And then we're like eating and having a good time. So um, I don't know specifically what uh, what artist it would be, but that's that's what I would be doing if there was music playing. This is party. I don't know if you're you're cooking tea, Evan, but for the cab franc, (laughs) I would go Arcade Fire. Hey, see, that's what I'm talking about. See, that's like that's like man, you're you're zoning. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's a really awesome comment. I love that. Um, well, so <clears throat> all of this chatter of music, this actually our Cabernet Sauvignon brings me back to Argentina when I was backpacking in 2009 and Kings of Leon, a nice asado, Ooh. a nice asado, oh my, some empanadas, yeah. our Ceja Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, eating al fresco, come on, you, you can't get, it doesn't get any better than that. So that's, that's amazing. That's, that's you know what, though? Actually, both the Seha and the Crocker and Star can do that. Yes, yes, they can. We should King just King of Leon. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Something, something sultry. Yeah. It's something with like a really soul forward mm-hmm. voice. Absolutely. And also salsa, because I mean, let's face it, everything pairs beautifully with some salsa music. So, ah. of course. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. There was one more. We've had a lot of uh, questions, ladies. Oh, yeah, I love it. There was, there was one. What are the biggest challenges facing winemakers in Napa? Well, Joshua Redbart, I think. Um, <laughs> I think uh, probably the weather yeah, uh, would be the biggest challenge right now. Um, and it's dealing with uh, what we don't know and how we can minimize what we don't know um, and then how we deal with that uh, with our grapes and for the vintages to come. So um, obviously 2020 being what it was, um 2017 i mean there's so many things that are happening right now that uh that's probably well, my biggest challenge um and certainly most people yeah fires are i mean i think going to be everyone's number one for a number of years but there's also global warming which there have been lots of conversations about changing or adding to what's actually grown in the region and thinking outside of the box that way, so to speak. It's not our um, usual varietals, our varieties, sorry, um, that are grown in the region. 
and and looking at at other things. So, what do you think about that? Because I've heard some stuff too. <laughs> You know, there are those that have already kind of jumped in and started experimenting. Um, For sure. I, I think there's an element of when, when we've talked about um, in the previous years before the last four, when we talked about, when we talked about climate change of how is that going to impact the wine industry? I think mostly people talked about it in the way of what are we planting where? And now it's become so much bigger than that of we have all these other things too, where it's not just like degree days and the overall heat that will ripen something. We're having extreme heat spells that, and we're getting better about the technologies that will go into that of row orientation for planting. And some of these are things that aren't just a good idea now, given the extremes that we're facing, they would have been a good idea the whole time if we figured out that like these specific row orientations are great. These types of shade cloths work well. So there are things like that that we are learning and keeping up with on the technology. Um, but a bigger issue is how many years will we lose to smoke? How many years will it be before we have viable treatments for smoke that actually do something and aren't just sort of magic beans? Um, so I would say with some new vineyards that I'm planting, like I am heavily taking that into consideration with planting early season varietals to give myself the best shot in years where we have fire that I'll get things off the vine before there's smoke contact. I'm planting red varietals that also make a lovely rosé. Um, so just trying to diversify a little bit and not hedge everything on late season cab and varietals like Petit Verdot and things like that, that, that we know are very sensitive to smoke taint. Um, so there's a lot of different technical ways that we can go about it. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no one answer for sure. We're going to be talking and working and developing solutions for many, many years. So we've got a couple of more questions. And Vivian uh, Gay, you're absolutely right. When I, because I'm kind of connected to all these different organizations, sometimes when I say Roots Fund, I'm thinking Hughes Society as well, because it's just, it's actually tentacles of Hughes Society. Um, but yes, Hughes Society is another resource um, for people to look into um, and to reach out to if they are interested in uh, getting into the wine industry. And when we say getting into the wine industry, it could mean so many different things. It's not just as a winemaker, it's as a sommelier, it's as um, a wine educator. Um, it's, you know, the back of the house, which is what I like to call it, which is the business of wine, the nuts and bolts, sales, and, and the back end of things, right? Um, there's also being in what I call the field and, and being in, um, in the vineyards as well, you know, as a viniculturist is, is, and not as um, a winemaker. But then there's some really great things that we have. We have a lot of comments from people that are just super excited about our panel tonight. And I think you all can see those um, as well. And there's a comment from someone who says they're almost 35 and wants to get into winemaking. Uh, how do we recommend that they get started, but their goal is to open a bar. So wine bar. Um, if you want to open a wine bar, you don't necessarily have to be a winemaker. But the first place to start is what I said, informational interviews. Thank you, Tanya. This is Stacy. We have reached Oh, about an hour and a half now. So I just wanted to see if we could wrap it up with a nice cheers on a high note. No worries, because that was kind of the last thing. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And as you see, we could all go on talking <laughs> forever about everything. And so choose your favorite glass. For right now at this very moment ladies where you are cheers everyone cheers everyone cheers. thank you so, thank much, you so much for joining us 
um, tonight. And this is just the beginning of conversations like this. And um, the only way to continue and move forward is to do what we're doing, which is to support one another. And Absolutely. this is what you see. What you see on the screen is what's in the wine industry for women. So cheers. Cheers. Right. Cheers. cheers, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank Good you night. so much.